Watts was unfortunately also regarded as an unfaithful husband, poor father, and kept up a habit of heavy smoking and drinking, especially his usual habit of whiskey before a lecture. He said to my sister one time, I like myself better when I'm drinking. What were some of your, your last memories of your father? I, I know it's well documented. Uh, he had uh, some problems with alcoholism and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what were you close to him by the early 70s? He died in 1973. Were you still? Yeah, um, I knew he was having problems with with drinking um he'd come out to visit me several you know when whenever he came east he usually stopped to visit me i usually had set up a lecture for him someplace you know just that kind of thing um mm -hmm. so i i didn't see much of him during the years between oh um 1959 and 1969 i guess that, was okay. that 10 year period um, but, um, uh, it was, it was heartbreaking, really. Um, sure. his, his wife, uh, was, uh, deeply involved in alcohol and, um, uh, she mm. would just pass out and be a problem. So that was difficult. And, sure. um, it was difficult to see him, uh, do pretty much the same thing although he's he's he always rallied i you know i would um my husband at the time and i would have to often drive him to a lecture and um it would be amazing to us that he would be inebriated hmm. he'd get out on the stage and sit there and he would just go off and <laughs> say what he said and people would ask questions and half the time uh he didn't answer the question, but he would say something that, that still totally, something that totally uh, somehow the person would just hang on the words, you know, and I just, yeah. it, it amazed, amazed me. And, and then there, of course, were his critics uh, that, you know, said, oh, you know, he's just a drunkard and whatever. And no, he, it was sad, you know, alcoholism is just a terrible disease. And he tried, um, many times to to stop he tried to stop smoking um he ended up in the hospital a couple of times with dts and it was mm -hmm. scary um so you know it was just it, it was a very difficult thing your father was brilliant so those critics can you know, take a hike as far as I'm concerned. Now, for many people, this is a Reddit post I found that I thought was sort of interesting from his biography in my own way. This is Alan Watts's biography and people had written how it was kind of disappointing to find out he was an alcohol uh, alcoholic. I think there's something to that, but I don't think it's the disappointment of having the disease. It's the disappointment of what came also with Alan Watts's reputation, his infidelity, his bad parenting, his alcoholism. It sort of indicates a level of weakness, like an undisciplined nature. And though we recognize that alcoholism is a disease, we're not faulting him for that addiction. We're asking about the conversation around the discipline of that addiction. So I'm not going to read this whole thing here. He says, how could he possibly be a genuine mystic and be so addicted to nicotine and alcohol? or have an occasional shudders of anxiety, or be sexually interested in women, or lack enthusiasm for physical exercise, or have any need for money. Such people have in mind an idealized version of mystic as a person who wholly free from fear and attachment, who sees within and without and on all sides only the translucent forms of a single divine energy which is everlasting love and delight, as which and from which he effort effortlessly radiates peace, charity, and joy. What an viable situation. We too would like to be one of those. But as we start to meditate and look into ourselves, we find mostly a quaking and palpitating mess of anxiety, which lusts and loathes, needs love and attention, lives in horror of death, putting an end to its misery. So we despise that mess and look for ways of controlling it and putting how the true mystic feels in its place, not realizing that this ambition is simply one of the lusts of the quaking mess. And that is in turn, is a natural form of the universe like rain and frost, slugs and snails, flies and disease. When the true mystic sees flies and disease as translucent forms of the divine, that does not abolish them. I, making no hard and fast distinction between inner and outer experience, see my quaking mess as a form of divine, of the divine. And that doesn't abolish it either, but at least I can live with it. Alan is just a person. He's a person on a journey. And yes, Emmy in chat says human's going to human. Human's going to human. 
It is the slogan of this channel for that reason alone. Because whether or not you're this thing called enlightened, which a lot of people think Alan Watts was, he's still a human, a biological mess of a person. But I would say he is not acting within his enlightenment when he gives in to those weaknesses of character. And that is sort of the difference. I talk about this. We've been exploring this idea of, you know, fiveness. Fiveness is my philosophy of the levels of introspection. And the question is always, is Alan Watts a five? Well, I don't know. I don't know enough about Alan Watts and why he did anything. I can't properly level people unless I'm inside your heads. And the truth is, in order to level someone, it'd have to be an ongoing conversation. But I would say from what I've discovered, uh, from the data is sometimes I think people end up in fiveness and stay there. That's where they stagnate, which is fine. Some people go deeper into fiveness and then beyond. Some people sort of reach fiveness, but want to take in the comfort of the two bubble, which is to sort of go back into the ego, right? The idea of fiveness for me, when I think about my own philosophy system and why I created it was to explain that experience of realizing we are one in nature. Nature is us and we are nature. So to give in to that lack of discipline, I would say is outside of your fiveness and yet within your nature, because all of the levels are your nature. Whether you're a one or a five, you're still in your nature because you are always your biology. Alan is just a person who gives in to a lot of, I guess, lacking of discipline moments. He doesn't hold discipline as a priority, it seems, which could be for a lot of reasons. I mean, maybe he never got the right therapy he needed. Maybe he never went to level five. Maybe he is a two. I don't know anything about this man. As a real consciousness, I don't know these things. Best we can do then is to train our attention towards living in the present. Unless one is able to live fully in the present, the future is a hoax. There is no point whatever in making plans for a future which you will never be able to enjoy. When your plans mature, you will still be living for some other future beyond. You will never, never be able to sit back with full contentment and say, now I've arrived. This insight makes Watts equally skeptical of meditation and psychedelic drugs, especially when people use them to lose their ego or experience ego death. Getting rid of one's ego is the last resort of the invincible ego, he writes. Mm. Namely, trying our very hardest to get rid of the ego just reinforces its separateness. Perhaps what Watts asks of us is to take on a passive recognition of the everythingness of everything. According to Watts, recognizing this evokes a certain passivity to the sensation, as if you were a leaf blown along by the wind, until you realize that you are both the leaf and the wind. He says a lot of the right stuff, but his life is not a reflection of that. And yet, when he says this here, this is kind of key. It was never about perfection. Enlightenment was never about perfection. That's why we always say before enlightenment, you carry water and chop wood. And after enlightenment, you carry water and chop wood. You're still just a person. You have bias and prejudice like the same. Now, when you are fully enacting sort of what I think is enlightenment, this construct we created, then I think you're able to sort of make a more neutral decision. And yet that neutrality comes from your ability to think, which comes from your biology. So it still begs the question about the free will and it begs the question about determinism and it begs the question about enlightenment itself. Is enlightenment a construct we created to feel better about the fact that we just exist? And is that good enough? We need to abandon the policy, which I would call Kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. Cass says, I think hard for us to accept things that can have good ideas but are still imperfect. I think the dilemma is, again, I as a human prefer people that walk the walk. So it's hard to witness somebody who cannot walk the walk of something they so discovered. But then I want to know how much genetics play a role in this. I think that's kind of the missing part of it, right? I think that's sort of the missing part. I was having this conversation with my partner because I'm reading Determined and I'm thinking about all these things, which kind of plays into this idea of having no free will based off of a biological component. So maybe it's not that Alan Watts is undisciplined. It's that Alan Watts was always going to be this kind of person. This was always going to be his story. And at the same time, how do I live in a world where like, I don't have to deal with the Alan Watts. But at the same time, look how much interesting and good thoughts come from him, right? Look how he's impacted so many people for the positive. So maybe it's not about people being perfect, which spoiler never was. And it's about learning that that imperfection should lead us to a better relationship with the self. Now, the question is, when Alan Watts died, did he have a better relationship with himself than the version of him in the past? Did he leave this world feeling peaceful with that realization? So it's one of those things where what is that? What is that? And how does that coincide with sort of his realization of something? How do you realize something? So one of the things I've said about fives is you can't go back to being a two 
But, you know, and the reason I don't write this down is because I get new data every year. But some of the new data that I've been seeing and my own anecdotal way of gathering it has shown that maybe instead of thinking fives couldn't be twos, fives might actually desire, instead of moving forward with introspection, might actually desire a, a sort of limitation into introspection because of an attachment they have. And because fiveness or enlightenment is sort of a practice, and again, loosely using these words and terminologies here, associated with a practice that has to be consistent, introspection has to be practiced. If you stop practicing introspection as a five, could you then de like go back to sort of a two? Or at least get stuck in the two thinking? That's like a question I ask myself. So maybe Alan, at moments in his, of his life, experience sort of an understanding of self within the universe that he is a leaf in the wind. But instead of, you know, being joyful with that realization, still decided to like do things that were considered not disciplined, which maybe the leaf was never meant to be disciplined. Maybe disciplined as a part of introspection is an illusion of the self and the ego. Emmy says, can you be a five and still have that attachment or would it be choosing to have the attachment? It would be having the right relationship with the attachment. So the idea is having the right relationship with the attachment, which is the natural relationship with the attachment, which is the realization that you never had the attachment to begin with. And he says, is it a, if you don't use it, you'll lose it type of deal? I'm thinking it, yes. I think introspection is if you don't use it, you'll lose it, but you're also human. And so you'll have moments of being too tired to think, which is a genetic or not genetic, but a biological sort of impact on your cognitive ability. But also there's some studies, we don't know, right? This is like all being examined and sort of understood slowly, but we don't know. So we're still figuring it out, right? We're throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks. We don't have the answers to a lot of these things, but we have is enough information to have better relationships with ourselves. It's not about perfection. It's never about perfection. You can't transform yourself. You can't make yourself sane, you can't make yourself loving, you can't make yourself unselfish. And yet it's absolutely that necessary that we be that way. If we are going to hand over the direction of nature to nature, which is what it comes to, it's absolutely necessary, not by anything that we call doing it, acting, willing, or even just accepting things. You can't do it. Why? because you don't really exist as that kind of a separate ego or personality. It's just an idea based on a phony feeling. So when it comes down to it, it's shocking news for us, for the human race, for our pride. You're only making a mess by trying to put things straight. You're trying to straighten out a wiggly world and no wonder you're in trouble. Ann Watts, she's the daughter of Alan Watts. So let's start at the very beginning. Um, you come from a family of quite a number of siblings. You have uh, five girls and there was two boys. And your father is very well known. And essentially, what was it like growing up? But that was my first burning question of what it was like <laughs> to have a father. And the world knows him as Alan Watts, but you knew him as father. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, what it was like was, was different really, than, than a lot of people. It wasn't a leave it to beaver kind of family situation. My father was married to my mother and I have an older sister and, um, and then myself and then they divorced. And he had five more children with his second wife, Dorothy. And um, I lived with my mother for a while and then I went and lived with my father and my stepmother and it was a it was challenging. It was a challenging um, experience. Um, I didn't get along that well with my stepmother. I had a stomach ulcer when I was at the age of ten, and my grandparents came to visit from England. My father's parents and um, it worked it out so that I could come and live with him, with them in the in England and go to girls boarding school, which was really a good thing for me. Um, in terms of living with, with Alan, um, there were lots of great things about it. He's, you know, fun, playful, um, creative, all of that. And he was often an absentee father. Um, just, he, he traveled quite a bit. He was, he'd be 
off writing and doing his writing and very focused when he was writing. And so there were lots of ways in which he wasn't available and in the ways that he was available. Um, we always had a good time and I felt very connected to him. And so then he, uh, he lived mostly up at, at, at what they called Druid Heights and, uh, and that's where he died. He died at which age? He died when he was 58. 58. Yeah, in yeah. his sleep. Yeah. Peacefully in his yeah. sleep. Yeah, my mother died when she was 58 as well, so. Oh, she did? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. And both my parents were serious alcoholics, so that, that was another part of all that. Yeah. Where do you think the alcohol played into all of this? I mean, it doesn't really go hand in hand with the drug taking, does it? Um. Because the drug is more conscious and opening mm -hmm. and, and uh, the alcohol is more uh, self-depreciating and more negative. Well, I think not so much for my dad. I think, I think what happened for him was that this, he said to my sister one time, I like myself better when I'm drinking. The basic idea of this link is interrelatedness, interlockedness, so that death and life, as I said, imply each other. I think it's interesting. Obviously, I agree with this idea. It's funny. We think about the imperfection of man. Like it said that the Buddha left his family to find enlightenment, right? Abandoned his wife and child. We think about Alan Watts, who is a philander, a cheater, and allegedly a bad parent and an alcoholic and all these things. And again, we're saying this out of like, it is what it is, more so than judgment. But when we're asking ourselves, what does it mean to be enlightened if you still abandon people? What does it mean to be enlightened if you succumb to, to disease? What What's the good of enlightenment? So what is the, even the point of it? Like, why would you even try to attain it for the ego? Ironically enough, I do think the seeking of enlightenment is still rooted in the ego which is why I think it's a construct that humans created. But also it's about foregoing that ego. So in order to reach this alleged enlightenment, you forgo the ego, but you seek it through the ego all the same. It's about fulfilling the self. That knowing you are a part of the living organism of the earth is to know that you are still seeking out your path and your path is rooted in like whatever the you is that you are explaining or experiencing. So it's kind of interesting. This idea of, oh, I'm going to seek enlightenment. What's the perks of that? Now, some people would say that the seeking of going on this path was your story and you didn't have a choice in it and you were going to do it no matter what, because maybe you're the category of person in which curiosity is like a really big deal for you, which is why I have this theory that when you get to level five, you're what I call like a baby five. And then the question is if you want to keep engaging in this journey or not, because maybe engaging in this journey is sort of an abandonment of the journey you were on. Or also, well, there's also this idea that we're all on solo journeys, right? And that solo journey sometimes coincides with someone else's journey but doesn't always end up there. So you separate. Now you could argue that the Buddha maybe had a journey in which he was with his wife at some point, but no longer. And maybe the abandonment of his wife was never an abandonment. Maybe in her head, she retells the story differently, right? Maybe it's not an abandonment. Maybe it's a separation of the solo journey. I mean, I don't own my husband, contrary to popular belief about marriage, like I don't own him. So if our solo journeys go in separate ways, that would be a possibility for the people that we are in the categorization that we're in, unlikely, but it wouldn't necessarily be an abandonment. It would be in a way that makes sense, but also is without self-harm and without cruelty or abuse. So the idea is that should my husband and I ever take our solo journeys separate from one another, it would be without these things because it would coincide with a mixture of our values, perceptions, and beliefs about the world. Now, we're not perfect and things could happen, but that's the idea. And I don't mean to predict the future. I just mean to say what I think would probably happen based off of the data that I have, which could be incomplete, of course, is incomplete, of course. Caitlin says, yes, I can't help but see enlightenment as a different sort of God. Well, I think the human is too rooted in its ego to ever see it as something as not a hierarchy of self, which is why I'm always shocked when people don't understand, but also not shocked 
when people go, oh, I'm a five. And I'm like, are you? And they're like, yeah, I'm definitely better than other people. I'm like, well, you're missing the point then. Because the idea of thinking you might be a five is to recognize you are not better than other people. You are simply another person or another organism within the living organism. You are not better. I am not better than other people. I am simply a another version of them reflected back to them. Again, in a philosophy sense, not in a micro practical sense, right? We're not talking about society. We're not talking about running your stupid governments. No offense. We're not, we're not talking about any of your civil rights issues because all of those things are constructs created by human beings, right? Those are the dilemmas we've placed ourselves in because of the way that the leaf have fallen. We're talking about the realization that you are still just a leaf in the wind. So when we get there, we're not better than other people. Even when I use the word stupid, it's to indicate a distaste, but not a betterment. It's a distaste, but it's not a betterment because it has a place that is so important and vital to the structure of that bubble. Forming a society is so good for the world and yet is only one part. It's very specific, right? So it's about knowing the differences between those things, which is very hard to explain since people put their whole life in this one aspect of existing in existence. And so they put their whole life in enlightenment or their whole life into politics or their whole life into civil rights or their whole life into what, you know, shoe they bought today. One might so easily have been you. I might so easily have been born in China and India. Why do I feel that the world is centered in this place as distinct from some other place? You jolly well know the world is centered where you are. This gives one a very strange feeling of the idea that other people jolly well exist in the same sense you do. Everybody's name is I. That's what you call yourself. So there will always be eyes in the world. Every eye is in a way the same eye. We all might be anyone else. This is the height of like what I say when I say fiveness for real is a realization that everyone is living in an eye. Everyone's life is just as important and valid as yours. Because you think in your ego that you are special. You think, oh, no one gets it like I get it. Or nobody lives life like I get it. Nobody's playing 4D chess the way I play 4D chess. No one's a great debater like I'm a great debater. No one's a great thinker the way I'm a great thinker. Nobody cares as much as like, oh, I have the toughest life. I have the most resilient life. I have the best. Everyone's life is just like yours. No one is different from you and no one is special and no one is anything. They are just So there's this idea, this deep, deep realization that everything is just you times a billion and a billion yous made the constructs and then built the skyscrapers and made the nuclear weapons and did what it was going to do. And then you think of the version of yourself that is flawed. So I think of the worst version of myself, whatever that means. And I think of a billion hers and I'm like, well, no wonder the world's a mess. And then I think of the best version of myself and I think, well, no wonder the world is the way it is. But it's too much because it doesn't fit into the practical. The practical is what keeps you grounded in the micro, in the bubbles, but doesn't allow you to be grounded in what it means to exist. So being grounded in existing is different than being grounded in the bubbles. The bubbles are what they are and we all have the bubbles but there's different bubbles. And so usually people pick ones or are born into ones that really are helpful practically. So when people are having a conversation about philosophy and they're talking about governments and they're talking, that's fine, it's a version of philosophy, but I'm not interested in how philosophy dictates the law because the law is a construct of the human need for order. And order is contrary to sort of nature, but nature has a natural order. So how do you become one with that natural order? Which is sort of what Peterson was getting at yesterday with Alex O'Connor. There is a nature and an order to that nature. And humans try to recreate that order through governments and laws and society. But yet it feels so counterintuitive to our nature. So we feel distraught and tired and exhausted and stressed. And oh my God, the responsibility that comes with this construct of order that is so contrary to our nature. And yet, because we are biology, 
everything we do is within our nature. So then the order we created was always one with our nature. The world is exactly the way it should be because it's exactly the way we created it to be. And we are nature. There's an order to the tornado, regardless of the destruction in its wake. There is an order to us, even when we leave destruction in our wake. Discord says, weird comment maybe, but something about the way he looks makes me not trust him. He's kind of looks sly and untrustworthy. Well, it's interesting because one of the reasons I've never liked Alan Watts, not as a consciousness, but as a sort of person to listen to is one, I don't like his fans. Two, I don't like the way people write about him on the internet or make videos about him. It's too pedestal-y. When people are pedestaled as an icon, I automatically raise an eyebrow. Well, one time I was visiting, I was a teenager, and we were at a, an event where my father was presenting, and one of the, a woman came up and asked if she could touch me. And it was for me like just so, like after that I stopped telling people who my dad was. You know, it was like, um, there's this aspect of, ooh, your father's Alan Watts, ooh, you know, and it was like, <sighs> I, I want to see be seen for myself, not for who my dad is, right? And I, it felt like people would put this overlay of him on me. And, and so, you know, so there was that kind of weirdness about being the child of a well-known person. Three, I don't much like his personal choices in his personal life to such an extent that I could hear these messages from somebody else much more interesting. Four... I like the messages, not the messenger, but I don't need to hear it from him when I could just read the books myself. So I kind of feel like that, but also he's a perfect example to me of a man, not the gender, but a human. He's flawed, he's imperfect, he's interesting, he's uninteresting, he knows some stuff, he doesn't know anything at all. He is a perfect example of why we do not pedestal people. Even the Buddha was imperfect, everybody is imperfect. It's the pedestaling that I think is the red flag. And not that Alan would have wanted it, by the way. Seeking perfection from people is an issue. So from the audience's perspective, pedestaling is such a frustrating thing because it's the opposite of what enlightenment should be. And on the other side of it, becoming an icon is sort of contradictory to that. So it's kind of interesting. I don't think he's a bad person. I think he was an imperfect person. He was obviously bad at his job, like he was bad at being a husband and he was bad at being a father apparently and he was bad at other things. But I don't think that it necessarily means he's a bad person. But I think pedestaling him is a mistake. It's like a mistake. In the same way that pedestaling anyone is a mistake. But at the same time, I'm glad that he turned something into such a digestible uh, lesson something that I think is really important for people to listen to if they're looking for this particular tool. Because the irony is the same people that took it from Alan Watts wouldn't listen to a Buddhist who doesn't look like Alan Watts say it. People will literally listen to Alan Watts say these things because he looks like them and sounds like them. And they wouldn't listen to somebody else who doesn't look like them and sound like them because we do trust information from people that we think are like us. So the fact that he's educated, the fact that he was at Berkeley, the fact that he had a radio show, the fact that he was a, he sold books, the fact that he is what society deems successful allowed him to share ideas that the West maybe wouldn't have digested in the same way, which is also a sign of the issues of what it means to be people. Why is it digestible to hear it from somebody who looks like us? Thank you.